Well, church, it's so good to be with you on this Sunday, Love for the House Sunday. At the end of this message, we'll be receiving an offering for anyone who wants to give. We do this once a year to raise finance for specific projects as an expression of our love for C3 Imagine and for the vision God has placed on our hearts. And last year, we invested in Imagine Kids. This year, we're investing in the venues we're in, the three different venues we're in, to make them and ensure their places of great hospitality, uh, of great cultural excellence, ready to receive people to worship God. So that said, we can talk a bit, a bit more about that locally straight after this message. But for now, we're launching into a continuation of our Unsung Heroes uh, series, and we're going to be focusing on David, King David of Israel, for the next four Sundays, and this being the first of those. So I've called this message, David and his love for the house. David was a great king, a man of honor, a soldier and a fighter, a shepherd and a poet. He was many things, but we're told quite clearly that he had a deep love for the house, for God's house. He was discovered to be a worshiper. He was discovered to long to be in the courts of God's house. And so when the sons of Korah wrote this Psalm, Psalm 84, David was quick to be able to put that as part of the compilation of the Psalms because it resonated so much with uh, his heart. And he says this in Psalm 84, verse one, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. I want us just to note that word place. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Verse four, blessed are those who dwell in your house, those being people. I want us to note that place, people. They are ever praising you. Verse 10, better is one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He's talking about the presence of God, the place of God, the people of God, and the presence of God. The Lord bestows, bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. This is love for the house. Do you know, I remember Lisby and I's first house, 6 Fairfield Parade, Cheltenham, Gloucestershire, England. It was our first home after getting married and we loved that house. It was a small townhouse, two rooms up, two rooms down, and uh, it had a very unique kitchen, high ceilings, very long and narrow with a skylight in it, very light. I remember us hanging dried flowers from the high ceiling and Lisby stenciled the walls. Great fond memories. I remember the sound of dial-up internet coming from the spare room. I remember the smells of French press coffee. We did all that we could to make it ready for having people there. We would entertain parties at New Year and all through the year, actually, and that was us. And, and so we turned that house into a home. I still, as I remember that place, love that place. There was something about the people and memories of that place, something about the presence of that place, something about the place itself that has carved out something in our hearts. This is love for the house. I'm calling us all to keep God's house like that etched into our hearts. The idea of the people of God's place, the idea of the presence of God's place and the place itself, that our love for God's house would be up there amongst all our firsts. Jesus is our first love. Clearly, we have a responsibility to love our family. And I would call you to keep God's house up there amongst those 
as amongst our first loves, as, as the sons of Korah described it here, that I would rather be one day in the courts of God than spend a thousand anywhere else. The sons of Korah really caught the heart of that. And so what does it mean to love God's house and how can we give to her? Okay, let's go back and read that verse, verse four. Blessed are those, that is the people, who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. The first thing we do when we love God's house is we love God's people. We love God's people as a way of loving God's house. Psalm 102 verse 13 says this, you will arise and have compassion on Zion. That's the city of God. For it's time to show favor to her. The appointed time has come. I, I don't know about you, I'm saying an amen to that. It's time for God's favor to fall on his house. And then he goes on to say, for her stones are dear to your servants and her very dust means uh, moves them to pity. What's the dust? That's the place. What are the stones? Well, let's look at 1 Peter 2.5. It says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. What are the stones? They are the people. The people are the building blocks. You and I are the very fabric, the building stones. We are the house of God. When you and I serve each other, we are serving to build God's house. You know, one of the very first things uh, Lizzie and I did as part of uh, sharing the load of building this church is we did our turn on roster in Imagine Kids. There were only about three families, maybe only two actually. Uh, there were only about four or five kids, but as parents, we all did our bit to be on roster to look after the kids. After all, they were our kids. I heard you. Parents, get on the Imagine Kids roster. Come on, let's build a city inspiring, a, 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 an Imagine Kids that reaches the kids of our communities. You could be part of that. Or maybe worship. I dream to build worship and write worship songs that has power and presence in it that really puts something in your soul, but more than anything, elevates the name of Jesus over all that we're doing and over our city. Maybe a place to serve there. But when we serve one another, we're serving to build the house. We engage in the fabric of the house. You get woven into the fabric of the house. You get planted deeper. It's our call, all of us, to be servants of God's house. Psalm 92, verse 13 to 15 says this, the righteous grow up like a palm, like a cedar of Lebanon. They rise up. They are planted in the house. This is a message with all the Ps. Okay. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They grow up in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit when they are old and remain strong and fresh. Who doesn't want to remain strong and fresh for all their years? Who doesn't want to be fruitful? That surely is the desire of every one of our hearts. How do we do it? We get planted into the house. We are engaged in the house. We are involved in the house. We serve one another. Uh, today, why don't you decide to get planted if you're not already? Why don't you decide to serve if you're not already? If you want to be equipped, maybe sign up for Imagine Bible College. But uh, anyway, just dive into a team and serve. We read in Psalm 84, he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper at God's house than be anywhere else. What is that to say? I'd rather be on the welcome home team than be anywhere else. That, what a great measure of our love for the house of God, that we would serve people and greet people and have our homes open to people, that we'd uh, be in a team blessing one another, serving one another we build the house of God. The second way we build the house of God and show we love the house of God is through his presence. Uh, a love for God's house means a love for his presence. There are so many Psalms of David that illustrate this, that are filled with a desire that David has to abide in God's presence. Take this one, Psalm 26, 8. Lord, I love the house 
where you live, the place where your glory dwells. It's in God's presence. God dwells. Many years ago, I uh, took a water skiing lesson. And uh, I don't know about you, but I rarely bother to read the instructions of anything. Uh, I always am that person who has pieces left over if I'm putting a piece of Ikea furniture together. I'm just not following the instructions. And so I was at this water ski place and this lady was trying to tell me how to water ski and all I'm doing is watching these kids do it with utter ease. I'm thinking, how hard can this be? So it comes to my turn and I crouch down in the position I'm meant to be in and ready for the wire. It was on a zip wire that went around a lake to, to click into action and pull me off the ramp and onto the water. And all was well. I went off, but my knees were bent. Hard to do in front of the camera, otherwise I'll disappear. But my knees are bent and my bum is low and I'm shooting off down the lake and I realize I have no idea how to stand up. I am crouched down and my bum is bouncing off the water. And uh, because my bum is bouncing off the water, the water is spraying into my face. And I'm not talking about a small amount of water. I was unable to breathe. And so after about 50 meters in this position, I have to let go. It's a matter of survival. And I'm lying in the water gasping for breath. I'm asking you today, when was the last time you drew near to God, just longing to be in his presence, longing to breathe the oxygen of heaven? When was the last time you turned up early for a worship service because you wanted to be in the presence of God? When was the last time you just allowed your prayer moments to linger just a little longer than normal so that you could spend time in the presence of God? When was the last time you looked through the lyrics of the song to a place of his presence? So the song, it wasn't so much about the songs, but about the environment, the atmosphere of God in the place. We love God's house by loving his presence. And finally, we love God's house by loving his people. We love God's house by loving his presence. But we see here in Psalm 84, it tells us we love God's house by loving his place. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. And it's on this one I want us to dwell for a minute because it's, it's on this one I want us to take action today and raise an offering to invest in our places. This isn't Vision Builders where we're trying to invest in the purchase of property. Uh, this is us trying to care for and love and make excellent what we've already been given. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Psalm 102 verse 14 as we read just now, for her stones are dear to your servants. Her very dust move them, moves them to pity. Just yesterday, I was moving some tiles on, on our outside garden and, and all this, this sand was there underneath and it, in all that mess and all that dust, you're very aware that this is our place I'm working on and remodeling. God wants us to get our hands dirty at looking after our place, the very dust of our place that we would, we would enjoy and appreciate, making it, making it something excellent for the Lord, inspirational for guests, a welcome home for us, as a standard of hospitality that we truly would serve the Lord by serving the place. One thing I ask from the Lord, Psalm 27 says, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, some of you may be asking, why should I love Arta? Is that what you're asking me to do? It's a school. Who's meant to love school after all? Or maybe you're sitting there in Boom, Chicago and you're going, love a comedy theater? I don't even like this sort of comedy. We're not talking about that particular purpose of that particular venue. We're talking about the ambiance 
that we create in the place. We're talking about the memories we create in the place. We're talking about the hospitality and the big hug that we offer in the place. We're talking about that that place like Six Fairfield Parade where we go, we are creating memories for a lifetime where milestones are achieved in people's lives. We create memories where people got saved, their lives got transformed, they were baptized in that place. There is something going on that's supernatural, a God encounter, a supernatural experience where worship lingers in that place place where we cannot wait to go up to the house of the Lord, whether it's a school, a comedy theater, or a, or a building we own for ourselves because we've created something in that place. You see, the environment really matters. When the place is on fire, when there is passion in the place, God can do something. When you and I get on fire, when you and I get on our front foot and we love the people, when you and I get on our front foot and lean in and, and love the presence, when you and I cannot wait to get up to the house of the Lord, when you and I are clapping and cheering and shouting amen and raising our hands and dancing and enthusiastic, when you and I are greeting visitors with great sense of warmth and interest and attention, when you and I are getting into uh, our groups and circles and, and really working through discipleship and being humble and teachable and growing in our faith and leaning into the word and praying. When we are doing that, we create a place where others get drawn into and attracted to the very Jesus that won our hearts. That's my dream for us. For C3, imagine that's Lisbon and I's dream that we would have a place where Jesus is held so high. It's an inspiration to anyone who walks in. So that means that we light the place up, not just in spiritual vibe, but in physical physicality, that we, we, we light it up with excellence. We light it up with great smells of coffee. We light it up with a well-cleaned environment, a place that smells good, a place that looks cared for, a place that's been given attention. The small details matter because it shows that we care, that we're ready. We're on our front foot. We're ready to receive others. We're ready to worship the Lord. It's a, about an expression of our love for the house. The place is on fire and the place is valued. It's excellent. It's not dull. It's life-giving. This is how David uh, is, uh, is talked about in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1. He says this, Then King David said to the whole assembly, the task is great because this palatial structure, get that? He talks about it as a palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. You got to understand, you see, David's longing was to build a house for God. God said, hey, David, there's so many battles you've had to fight. You've had to wage war, take ground. I'm not asking you to build this house. I'm going to let your son Solomon do it in a time of peace. But thank you. I love your desire. And so David determined to continue to express his love for the house by raising finance to help out his son to later build the house. And he dreamed of what he calls a palatial structure in which God could dwell. Verse 2, with all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver work, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all of these in large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures. This is David. He's, he's, not, just, he's not just gathering the wealth of the nation. He's giving from his own pocket treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above everything I have provided for his holy temple. And he goes on to give a list of all the things he gave and concludes, now who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? Church, this is a call to love 
This is a call to build. This is a call to serve. This is a call to value the house. This is a call to respond to what Isaiah said, a mountain of the Lord's house, which will be the chief mountain above all others. I can see a day when the influence of C3 Imagine will not just be in, in immediate localities, but will be citywide. It will be, re, it will be renowned for the numbers of people coming to Christ. It will be renowned for the influence we have in the fabric of our communities where we're not just providing a Sunday service and groups, but people are coming in and out of cafes we run or a school we have or a daycare we do or a gym we run. We are in the fabric of our communities. We're in the fabric of the day-to-day life of people. And Jesus is being introduced because you and I are serving people, building his presence and loving and valuing his place. And so today, as we take up an offering, as I I ask you to consider prayerfully giving generously over and above today, something that might be a stretch, but I'm asking you to do it, to serve, to build the future of this place, to serve, to build something excellent for the glory and the majesty of our King. And I know all three of our locations are at different stages and what we can do with our venues, but in all our locations, our desire is to continue to move forward, get the next place or upgrade the place we have so that we can show the community the type of church and the type of God it is that we serve. In Jesus' name, God bless you for your generosity. As I hand back over, uh, I know uh, uh, you're going to be led into a place of uh, a sacred offering, a sacred altar call that's going to be consecrated to the Lord. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, from Pastor Lisby and I, for all the generosity that you give into this house, C3 Imagine. God bless you.